All the documents regarding this case have been unearthed, and there are tons and tons of them. We find ourselves in Canada, and this is probably the most documented and investigated UFO case in North America. It even beats Roswell. It also beats all the other important cases for the number of investigations performed and the amount of paper that was consumed relating to these investigations. There exists an incredible episode of ufology that is truly disturbing. One of those episodes where the evidence and facts can no longer be hidden. And it is all here. The UFO incident at Falcon Lake, one of the biggest reports of a UFO sighting. Where an ordinary man was in very, very close contact with a UFO. And not only was he able to tell his story regarding it, he also has the scars of that incident on his own skin. Will these facts be enough to convince us that something besides the human race exists? There are countless apparitions, testimonies, elements of proof and reports. Surely one of the places in the world that no longer wants to remain silent on this matter is Canada. Where infinite contacts with aliens have occurred. Where ordinary citizens want to hear the truth, but where they always receive only silence. Of all the UFO events in Canada with the most reports and the most evidence and documents, three stand out. During a rainy night in August 1967, a series of crop circles mysteriously appeared in a farmer's field in Duhamel, Alberta. The local press was immediately notified, followed by a UFO club in Edmonton and then the national media. The six crop circles appeared to contain tread marks as if they had been made by a tyre, but only on small portions of them. Despite this, a scientist concluded that the circles were not a hoax. They tried to prove it by taking a soil sample, but the results proved inconclusive. In the end, the scientist admitted that the marks looked like they were made by a hovering plane, but he couldn't make a conclusion to his investigation one way or the other. The events of the year culminated in October of 1967, with an incident in the fishing village of Shag Harbour, Nova Scotia. Close to midnight, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, received several calls about a flying vehicle that had crashed into the harbour. The craft let out a whistle and a bright flash and then floated on the water for several minutes. Some witnesses, including RCMP officers, recall seeing a shimmering yellow glow from the foam surrounding it. Before a boat could reach the crash site, the aircraft sank underwater. A team of divers searched the harbour, but could not find any evidence of a wreckage. As happened in the Duhamel incident, the Shag Harbour case remains unsolved. In May 1967, Stefan Michalak ventured into the bush near Falcon Lake, Manitoba. He would come back out of the bush, claiming that he had not only seen two UFOs, but that one of them had severely burned him and given him radiation poisoning. Michalak said he saw the two spaceships in plain sight, one of which flew away while the other landed in front of him. 
he approached the aircraft and tried to greet its occupants. Finally, it took off again, blowing hot air from an exhaust panel. This set Michalak's shirt on fire and left a grid-like burn on his chest. Authorities didn't believe his account until he showed them the site where the ship had also burned the vegetation. For years, Michalak would suffer from the burns he received on his chest, where sores would reappear intermittently. The Falcon Lake Incident This UFO case is so much better than the infamous Roswell UFO case, where in 1947 a flying saucer allegedly crashed, and pieces of evidence were recovered by the US military and quickly taken away. Well, here not only do we have an incident where a witness was physically injured and his injuries were examined by doctors, but upon investigation, the case also uncovered physical evidence in the form of soil. The actual site itself was located, the radiation at the site was verified, and then later, unusual pieces of silver were discovered that were also radioactive. Therefore, we have physical evidence in terms of metals and soil, and we have physiological evidence in terms of the injuries Mr. Michalak suffered. Chris Rutkowski is Canadian and has been a scientist, writer and educator since 1970. He has written about his investigations of UFOs for more than 30 years and is one of the world's greatest experts on the subject. Chris has been investigating and researching UFOs since 1976 and since 1976 he has filed more than 20,000 separate cases of UFO reports, exclusively in Canada, with hundreds of pages and documents to back up his research. Chris is indeed one of the ufologists who worked the most on the Falcon Lake incident and brought a lot of documented evidence to the public. We are in Manitoba in 1967. Stephen Michalak is an industrial engineer with an interest in geology who appreciates nature and the wild. During a weekend in 1967, Stephen says he saw a flying object falling from the sky. He approached it, touched it and was hit by an incandescent gas that burned part of his clothes. It is still possible to see the original clothes he wore that night, more than half a century ago, as well as his partly burned cap. There is evidence and artifacts that make this case extremely interesting. It is a case where the puzzle is completed with physical and visual evidence. We have a credible eyewitness. The burned ground where the incident occurred and somebody who physically and psychologically felt the radioactive effects of something unknown. There are artifacts. The site has been thoroughly examined. The RCMP, the Royal Canadian Air Force, the RCAF, and the US Air Force all investigated the incident and all their documents are available to be examined. Even though there were hundreds of pages and photographs that have never been published because they were immediately destroyed, a lot of information can still be known in detail, and we have it before our eyes. The Canadian government, like many others, never says what's really going on, but they released a commemorative coin about the incident in 2018. Why? In the same 2018, an RCMP officer who lives in Winnipeg and was one of the lead investigators on the case was asked what he thought about the incident, and he replied, 
I definitely think Michalak saw what he said he saw. Here is where it all begins. This is a teletype that was sent to the National Research Council by the Canadian forces. And you can immediately see the priority stamp announcing the importance it had already been given at the time. Canadian Forces Headquarters received this report from Mr. Michalak. And this is a detailed description of what he saw. On the second page, he says he heard a whirring sound and an indistinguishable voice coming from inside. He says he touched the aircraft with his left hand and immediately the tips of his gloves started to burn. We have information of the whole story, though if we talk about the sighting place, it is very close to Falcon Lake and while now there is horseback riding in the years of the incident, the soil was in a completely different state. This is a copy of the photo that Mr. Michalak took for the RCMP and RCAF. You can see the muddy water and disturbed ground. He describes how all the soil was positioned at the time of the event and how all the moss and lichen had been burned. Mr. Michalak also noticed that the spacecraft landed exactly in a point on the ground where there was an evident vein of quartz of great value even for man. Where there is quartz, there are metals. In fact, Michalak was looking for silver and gold and that's exactly why he was close to these mines. Is this a coincidence? What do aliens use these metals for? As soon as Michalak saw these unrecognizable flying objects, he immediately thought of a sort of secret weapon of the Air Force, or perhaps of NASA, also because in those years there was the beginning of the Apollo program and his initial thinking was precisely influenced by these events. But only later, thinking about the external structure of the spaceship, did he realize that it didn't have any type of rivets or anything similar to human technology. During Mr. Michalak's extraterrestrial encounter, he managed to draw everything he saw he made a fairly detailed sketch of the spacecraft. It was approximately 35 feet in diameter and 12 feet high. It had a dome at the center, a door opening on one side that resembled a large grill, and two other grills were present on the other side. Michalak reports that he was able to observe them well, because while he was there, the two craft came out of nowhere from the sky, flying through the air. One flew a little lower, eventually landing on a spur that was close to where he was chipping away at the rocks. While the other one took off and left shortly afterwards, the one that had landed remained there for about 40 to 45 minutes. What were the aliens doing on the Earth for all that time? Someone or something definitely disturbed them because when going into more precise detail of the story, Michalak says that he approached the aircraft and started shouting to see if there was anyone inside who needed help. He reports that the surface of the spacecraft was similar to steel, but with an appearance that was very similar to glass, and it was completely smooth. Apparently, there were no signs of welding. It was certainly something he had never seen before, but he was convinced that it was some kind of handmade physical creation. His curiosity got the better of him, leading him to approach the spaceship. The surface of the ship was hot, but he reached out his hand to touch it. It melted the tips of the rubber gloves he was wearing. A short while later, as he was standing next to the aircraft, it began to rotate, got into position to take off and lifted off. As the craft lifted and rotated, it emitted a powerful jet of hot gas that struck Michalak in the chest. As the aircraft continued to rise, he was forced to tear off his shirt because it was on fire. 
He threw it to the ground and stamped on it several times and also had to rip off his tank top because it was getting hot. When he looked up again, the craft had already begun its ascent and was gone within seconds. Then he immediately started to feel unwell. He returned to his hotel, called his family and arranged to meet them in Winnipeg. After this, he immediately went for treatment at the Misericordia Health Center, where he was diagnosed with first and second degree burns. These marks on his abdomen were called checkerboard patterns, which were caused by the jet from the exhaust coming out of the side of the ship, as he describes it. These exact same signs can still be seen today on the shirt that Mr. Michalak wore that evening. Later, in conversation with his family, he realized that people should know about this absurd story because there may be an inherent danger. What if it happened to other people? This was his main concern. So, Michalak decided to make the story public and in fact, it was from this point a series of investigations began involving civilian investigators, the Royal Canadian Air Force, the Canadian Forces, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and even the United States Air Force, which had sent a group from the University of Colorado to study the case for its scientific investigation of UFOs. Mr. Michalak wanted his story to go public. In fact, we know that he contacted the Winnipeg Tribune one of its reporters, Heather Chisvin, and a photographer went to speak with Michalak at his home and gathered the necessary information for their article. A few days later, the story appeared in the newspaper with the headline, I was burned by UFOs. His story, as we can see, was also taken up internationally. We have other original photos of this incident because, in 1967, the cover of the book, My Encounter with the UFO, was created with an image including all the clothes Stephen Michalak was wearing on the day of the UFO encounter. There are the gloves with burnt tips, a burnt shirt, a hat and other clothing with evident signs of burns. Returning to documents, and in this case governmental ones, Chris Rutkowski published a copy of a report between the National Archives, the Canadian Forces Operations Centre and the RCMP Crime Lab. In this report, they state that they had taken some soil samples and they found that they had a radiation value of 0.3 microcuries. Dr. Booth, in this report, describes how the radiation is from a radium source and is a possible serious health hazard and he is sending an investigator to the Falcon Lake area. In fact, this level of radiation in Manitoba was very significant, to the point of making the stones and minerals dangerous for the public during that summer. This is an event where the facts are present and where traces of radiation have been found in a place that has been in contact with beings not belonging to our normality, and it is something real. All of this is thoroughly demonstrated with proof. There are literally hundreds of pages of documentation. And as mentioned before, regarding this incident, Chris Rutkowski is the ufologist who has published the most evidence supported by important documents. This, for example, is the first paragraph of the RCAF investigation. This report makes the government aware of everything that happened, leading them to investigate. And in fact, their investigations, on different levels, have produced reports and evidence that today can be seen with our own eyes. A fact that no one talks about, but which thanks to these documents we can now reveal, is the forced, manipulated landing of an RCMP helicopter. They were returning from the site of the UFO incident, 
when the helicopter suddenly lost power and they were forced to make an emergency landing on the Trans-Canada Highway. The landing was dangerous, both for those in the helicopter and the cars on the highway. No one ever mentioned this event, but now we have confirmation that it did actually happen. The helicopter that was carrying UFO investigators to a suspicious area was in danger of crashing. Is all this a coincidence too? However, speaking of documents and radioactivity, a year after the incident, Michalek returned to Falcon Lake with his friends, to the exact place the incident happened. They found radioactive silver debris that certainly shouldn't have been there. Today, many years have passed and all this material has mostly vanished, leaving a small piece that is still radioactive today. The US Air Force has finally released its account of the incident regarding the unidentified flying object. In their report, they explain that the evidence of the events is inconclusive and there are many inconsistencies. The Air Force continues by saying that the investigative developments have not altered their initial conclusion, that they didn't know anything about that flying object and that it had nothing to do with them. However, they conclude by saying that Mr. Michalak underwent a real physical experience which shows the existence of an unidentified vehicle that the human race is unaware of. In all of this, however, there is an important difference. On the one hand, the Americans, after finding out about this incident, decided to refute any part of Michalak's story. On the other, in Canada, the DND and the RCMP couldn't deny the incident happened, because the evidence in front of their eyes was very clear. In fact, in this report, both are unable to provide actual evidence capable of refuting the story of Falcon Lake, therefore the story of Stephen Michalak. Here we have a memo from the Radiation Protection Division, where it sends a report stating, Regarding the recent UFO investigations performed by the DND in the Falcon Lake area, they indicate a high level of radiation compared to the norm. There is also a request for CFP Edmonton to obtain solid soil samples for analysis. In fact, in the following years, this became a parameter method in UFO investigations because they became increasingly linked to radiation. Many other documents are in the hands of ufologist Chris Rutkowski. Documents that state how much the government remains silent to the public, but actually takes this situation very seriously. In 1967, the Canadian government began investigating crop circles. This is a National Research Files document about something that was found in Camrose, Alberta. In a field, there were crop circles. Here, you can also see photographs of these circles. In addition to these photos, you can also see a drawing that shows a kind of map, which marks all the various circles found in this particular field. Chris Rutkowski was able to find a document called on-site inspection of reputed UFO landing marks at Duhamel, Alberta, from the Suffield Memorandum, and as you can see, it is document number 49 out of 67. And not only, the Canadian forces investigated these unusual crop circles much earlier because they thought they were related to UFOs. We can find graphs that show us the most obvious truth. This is a graph that gives us an idea of how many UFO cases occur each year. 
It begins in 1989, even though we know that human beings came into contact with these extraterrestrials much earlier. An important note about these statistics that we need to keep in mind for our future is that most of the time the lines go up rather than going down. Finally, to expand a little further, here is a NORAD file from 2019. It explains that during Halloween, the pilot of a China Air airline flight and the pilot of another airline saw an orange light in the sky. The Chinese pilot said he saw the light in flight, while the other pilot, who saw it from a different direction, said the light was in downward flight. They claim this light was heading 55 miles south of Kelowna, British Columbia. On November the 1st, the next day, another similar orange light was once again seen in the sky. These are no longer just empty words, but present evidence of UFO incidents supported by documents, testimonies and artifacts. For 45 years, the Canadian government investigated unidentified flying objects. Several of its departments and agencies compiled reports of UFO sightings in Canada, mostly in Canadian airspace, from 1950 to 1995. These investigations began during the Cold War and what began as a military mission eventually became a scientific question. However, the modern era of UFO sightings began in 1947. On June the 24th, the pilot Kenneth Arnold reported seeing nine flying saucers emitting a bright light, flying over Mount Rainier in Washington state. The first post-war UFO sightings in Canada occurred that same year. The Cold War had just begun. The Canadian government was initially concerned that UFOs could pose a threat to national security if they turned out to be advanced Soviet technology. From the outset, however, the government was reluctant to study this subject. It devoted few resources to it, believing UFOs to be natural phenomena or the products of delusional minds. In fact, in the early 1950s, the government launched two separate UFO projects. Both were precautionary and intended to appease public concern. But, in 1995, due to budget cuts, the government stopped collecting reports altogether. However, this did not deter passionate and suspicious citizens, who in fact continued to investigate UFOs themselves. The first was called Project Magnet, which lasted from 1950 to 1954 and was born from an idea by Wilbert Smith. Smith undertook experiments to determine if UFOs flew using energetic magnetism. He also launched a balloon into the night sky to solicit sighting reports and test them. Finally, he built a UFO observatory at Shirley's Bay, a military site west of Ottawa. In any case, Smith's experiments were inconclusive. He had finally come to believe that UFOs were extraterrestrials from beyond planet Earth. And in fact, for this reason, his personal vision started to get bad publicity and the Department of Transportation decided to close Project Magnet. 
the government wanted to establish an official position on UFOs. To this end, the Defence Research Council established Project Second Story, which lasted from 1952 to 1954. This short-lived committee was chaired by the astronomer Peter Millman. Millman was a UFO skeptic. In his opinion, they were not of extraterrestrial origin and the project was a waste of time and resources. The committee didn't actually investigate any sightings. It acted only as an advisory body. It worked to standardize a form of UFO sighting. It also attempted to debunk the sightings as nothing more than misidentified natural phenomena, such as meteorites. Project Second Story concluded that UFOs, if real, are not amenable to scientific investigation. Military intelligence decided that the Soviet Union was probably not responsible for these unidentified flying objects, and it is precisely for this reason that UFOs then became a scientific matter. From the mid-1960s onwards, the RCMP was the primary agency responsible for collecting UFO witness reports. Government scientists, however, were reluctant to engage with the issue. Multiple reports were archived and sadly forgotten. Several years later, however, things changed, thanks to the many curious citizens who never gave up on their research. They were certainly the key for us to be able to have all this evidence today. Thanks to them, we are aware, for example, of the three most documented cases of UFOs. The famous UFO reports of the year 1967, which were particularly unusual even for the sceptical Canadian government, and which caused them some concern. The cases of the Falcon Lake incident, the Duhamel crop circles and the Shag Harbour incident have provided not only new evidence to consider, but physical evidence to inspect, which nearly all other reports lack. We are faced with the truth, as a matter of fact. In any case, even if these three incidents are the most documented, the archives are, however, inundated with reports of UFO cases. In 1989, one of the initial studies was produced, which found that between 140 and 150 UFO cases had been reported in Canada alone. Not only to the National Research Council, but also to private institutions, to the police and so on. Curiously, the number has risen quite steadily since then. UFO sightings in Canada reported each year number over 1,000, or around three per day. The files at the LAC are huge when it comes to UFOs. Most of them are currently online. There is a specific site where a certain number of these files can be observed. They cover from before 1950 to the present day, almost 2,000 of them, and they are all files from the RCMP, the National Research Council, the National Defence and the Ministry of Transport, as mentioned before. This site provides access to over 9,000 digitised documents from the Government Records Collection. These documents include reports and investigations of UF sightings all across Canada. According to the 2002 Canadian UFO survey, Toronto had the most sightings, with 34, followed by Vancouver, with 31, and Terrace, British Columbia, with 25 reports. In 2002, a typical UFO sighting lasted about 15 minutes. From 2007, 
the Canadian federal government directed all UFO sightings to Chris Rutkowski of the Ufology Research Centre in Manitoba. On July the 15th, 2018, a Canadian news site mentioned a new study conducted by Ufology Research, formerly known as Ufology Research of Manitoba, stating that there were more than 1,000 UFO sightings reported in Canada in 2017. So what is more true than all of this? Why do they keep trying to hide the truth that we can see in front of our eyes? Infinite cases, infinite documents, infinite proof. Going back a little in time, but still dealing with secret cases involving the Canadian and American governments, there is an ambiguous fact that has been hidden for years, but now we have managed to get to the related documents, giving us the chance to examine them. This is the story of Avro Canada's VZ-9 Avro Car Flying Saucer Project. Let's start from the beginning. Over the centuries, the idea of man reproducing flying saucers has always been a part of humanity, and more specifically, not only in the individual citizen, but also by governments. The first question to ask is, where before imagining them did these people see a flying saucer? If they want to replicate one, it is because they have already seen one. And why is the government so interested in these flying saucers? This idea of a flying car, if we want to be precise, dates back to the 1920s. Henry Ford tried to build a flying vehicle, which he called the Ford Fliver, and although the project ultimately failed, a sleek two-seat aircraft called the Waterman Arrowbeal debuted in 1937. Because it was a total failure, and also due to the war in general, this idea was abandoned. But, in 1953, it re-emerged during a top-secret meeting between Canadian and British intelligence. And this is where we have a great example of all this. It all starts thanks to a German engineer who claimed to have worked for the Luftwaffe during the war and to have worked on the construction of a flying saucer. The engineer said that the saucer was able to fly by generating a thrust cushion between itself and the ground. After discovering this news, a meeting was held with the Secret Services, where John Frost was also invited to take part, and in the meeting, the whole concept of a flying saucer was explained to him in great detail. Proof of this project, including all the drawings, through the fault of the Red Army, was unfortunately destroyed by the Germans. However, the concept intrigued Frost, and it wasn't long before Avro Canada began work on its own secret project. To explain in detail, we can start by saying that also thanks to Leonardo da Vinci's studies on birds, the airplane was born with wings, and has remained more or less so until today. But the shape of the wing and its ability to create a lifting force when hit by a jet of air is not the only method that can be used to fly. To get off the ground, one could exploit the Coanda effect, a phenomenon first used by the inventor Henri Coanda in 1910, although it had been discovered by the British physicist Thomas Young more than a century earlier. According to the Coanda effect, the jet of any fluid, such as water or air, tends to adhere to a nearby surface and follow its contours. To try this effect, just bring a spoon close to a jet of water coming out of a faucet. This effect is exploited for many applications in aerodynamics. In fact, many airplanes use systems to generate the effect by improving the performance of the wings, especially at low speeds. Precisely on the basis of this idea, between 1953 and 1958, the Canadian company Avro studied a project for a fighter plane with exceptional characteristics. 
supersonic, but at the same time able to take off vertically and stop, suspended in the air like a helicopter, commonly called a flying saucer. The Avro Canada VZ9 AV Avro car was a secret project developed during the early years of the Cold War at the request of the United States Air Force and the Canadian company Avro Aircraft, based in Ontario. The designer of the aircraft was precisely John Carver Frost, who worked for Avro Canada from 1947 after a long collaboration with some British companies, and he managed to participate in the Special Projects Group. In 1952, the Special Projects Group team began its research on VTOL, or Vertical Takeoff and Landing aircraft, focusing in particular on a project by Frost. It was a sword-shaped fighter that made use of the pancake engine, a name invented by Frost, which was then baptised with the name Project Y. This aircraft was designed in such a way as to lift on its tail, guaranteeing a minimum of ability to exploit vertical takeoff. The Canadian government joined the project and soon requested an initial prototype. Unfortunately, in 1953, the Canadian company ended up with just a wooden model and paper designs in hand, after having invested, however, 4 million Canadian dollars. For this reason, the project was removed from the funding list of the Canadian Experimental Department of Defence. After the Canadian government had shut down the project, Frost didn't want to give up and somehow managed to get US interest in his project. In fact, in 1953, a group of military experts visited Avro Canada to view a fighter plane, and during this trip, Frost diverted the group to the headquarters of the Special Projects Group and showed the American military a scale prototype and drawings and plans for the construction of a disc-shaped aircraft with the name Project Y-2. The USAF agreed to finance Frost's group and they started a new project. They decided to rename the Project Y-2 prototype as Project 1794. Frost and his colleagues began the design and construction of an innovative aircraft that would be equipped with an advanced weapon system and capable of reaching speeds exceeding Mach 2. They were literally housed in a secret facility in the company's main headquarters, the group using all the conveniences worthy of a secret project including armed surveillance and the use of key cards. Inside this technological fortress, Frost surrounded himself with engineers and designers fed on futuristic visions. Frost chose eight engineers to work with him to recreate what the German engineer initially illustrated to him. They started with a test model that was powered by six Armstrong Siddeley Viper engines that spun a central rotor. Unfortunately, the first test phase proved to be a failure and the supersonic test model suffered large oil leaks, which caused three small fires. Finally, they did one last and disastrous test with a Viper engine in 1956, and seeing that this too was almost lethal, they convinced Frost of the need to design a new, safer vehicle. So, after redesigning the supersonic model for a much simpler aircraft, Avro Canadian Special Projects Group came up with the VZ 9AV Avrocar. The Avrocar was presented as a test model for the subsequent production of a disc shaped supersonic vehicle uniquely designed for the United States Air Force and was later offered to the US Army as a flying jeep. Taking advantage of the cook craigie system, in 1957 two official Avro car aircraft were built, one to be used in tests in the NASA wind tunnels in California and the other for flight tests in the Canadian plant in Middleton. 
This type of aircraft specifically had three jet engines that blew on a turbine, which in turn rotated a large central compressor, making it spin on itself. On the sides of the disc, there would be a series of vents with variable flaps that would allow the pilot to fly the disc in any direction. The sucked in air, mixed with the gases from the engines, was conveyed internally up to the edge of the disc, where it was expelled downwards, creating the air cushion that supported the aircraft. Therefore, it was able to take off and land vertically. The thrust of the engines was also diverted onto the external shape of the disc to give stability to the aircraft. The Avro car was supposed to reach a maximum speed of between 400 and 500 km an hour and an operational altitude of 3000 meters. In any case, in the following three years the prototypes actually flew and many technical difficulties were overcome, but all this wasn't enough because yes, the objects certainly worked, but they didn't exceed Frost's expectations, nor those of the investors. The Avro car was unable to rise more than one meter off the ground, and its top speed was also very disappointing, about 50 kilometers an hour. Unfortunately, in fact, the performance never lived up to the promises, even after all the continuous efforts. The US Air Force, which was funding the project, decided to abandon it. Even after this case, our questions are endless. But we are constantly faced with evidence that has been kept secret by different governments and which now confirms the existence of something very big, around us and among us. Will they have succeeded in these years of UFO experiments and discoveries in designing one or more working flying saucers? Did the government really abandon this case? Having gathered enough information after all these years and after the investments that governments have made on these projects, we know that they really want to hide something huge from us, something vitally important to humanity. According to a memo written by the Department of National Defense, sightings of unidentified flying objects in Canada occurred during the first half of the 20th century. However, the Canadian government did not take an interest in gathering information on the sightings until 1947, as mentioned before. But now we have many examples of documented UFO appearances, and as we know now, more and more of them in Canada. 1951, Gander, Newfoundland. On February the 10th, 1951, a US Navy aircraft flying to Iceland from the town of Gander reported a near collision with a large circular orange UFO that literally circled around the US aircraft. 1960, Klan Lake, Northwest Territories. On June the 18th, 1960, a prospector told the Yellowknife RCMP detachment that a month earlier, he and his partner saw a UFO at Klan Lake, located 30 miles north of Yellowknife. According to ufologist Chris Rutkowski, the men claimed they saw a hovering object four to six feet wide that hit the surface of the lake. The RCMP investigated, but found nothing. 1969, Prince George, British Columbia. In Prince George, British Columbia, Three unrelated witnesses reported a strange, round object in the late afternoon sky on January the 1st, 1969. The sphere radiated a yellow-orange light and appeared to ascend from 2,000 to 10,000 feet. 1975-1976, Southern Manitoba. 
several sightings were reported of a red, glowing UFO, sometimes described as mischievous or playful, sighted in southern Manitoba in 1975 and 1976. The UFO was nicknamed Charlie Red Star by the public. 1978, Clarenville, Newfoundland and Labrador. A single sighting of a UFO by 12 individuals in the early morning of October the 26th, 1978, occurred in Clarenville, Newfoundland and Labrador, near Random Island. The object was reportedly oval-shaped with a fin on its tail. Individuals who spotted the object called the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the dispatched officer, Constable James Blackwood, witnessed the UFO hover 100 feet above the water for around one or two hours before vanishing. Blackwood used a telescope specialized for drug surveillance to observe the UFO and other eyewitnesses used binoculars. According to Blackwood, when he shone his headlights on the object, the object would react by shining its headlights back. Reportedly, Blackwood was attempting to contact the pilots of the craft. It left no evidence of its appearance, apart from eyewitness testimony of the event. 1990, Montreal, Quebec. On November the 7th, 1990, in Montreal, Quebec, witnesses reported a round metallic object of about 540 meters wide over the rooftop pool of the Bonaventure Hotel. Eyewitnesses saw eight to 10 lights forming into a circle above them, emitting bright white rays. The phenomenon lasted three hours from 7.20 to 10.20 p.m. and moved slowly northwards. While none could identify the lights, a few witnesses, according to the next day's report in La Presse, were ready to express their belief that they were visited by aliens. 1997, Trail, British Columbia. At least two women standing on the bridge over the Columbia River waiting for the fireworks show on the evening of July the 1st witnessed three small lights above them. These lights quickly took off down the river just a foot or two above the water's surface. They zigzagged along the river heading eastbound until they flew out of sight. The two women, who were strangers, looked at one another in awe realizing that it wasn't part of the fireworks show that hadn't yet begun. It was still daylight. 2010, Harbour Mill, Newfoundland and Labrador. During the night of January the 25th, 2010, there were multiple UFO sighting reports in Harbour Mill, Newfoundland and Labrador. Royal Canadian Mounted Police initially stated the reports were due to a missile launch, but later retracted the statement, and the Office of the Prime Minister stated that the UFOs were not missiles. Due to Harbour Mill's proximity to Saint-Pierre-Miquelon, residents suspected French military activity, an assumption which was dispelled by an official statement by the French government confirming there was no military activity taking place during the reported incident. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police referred to the event as an unexplained sighting and NORAD stated there was no known rocket launch at the time. The event prompted Member of Parliament for the constituency Harper Mill was in at the time, Jerry Byrne, to press the government for further information regarding the incident and criticised the Conservative government on its lack of transparency. 2014, Kensington, Prince Edward Island. While putting out a bonfire late in the evening of June the 4th, 2014, 
John Shepard witnessed unusual lights in the sky over the Gulf of St. Lawrence and captured 22 minutes of it on his cell phone. After reporting the incident to MUFON and their investigation concluding it being a confirmed sighting, CBC covered the event. The next day, CBC released a follow-up article in which a series of alternate explanations for the event were presented. 2014, North York, Ontario. Between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. on Saturday, July the 26th, 2014, there were multiple UFO sighting reports. At around 9 p.m., Sarah Chun witnessed a string of six or seven diagonal flashing lights in the sky from her window. She observed the flashing lights for about 25 minutes and recorded two videos on her iPad, which were later posted on her YouTube channel. Toronto Police's 32nd Division reported receiving several calls on the unidentified flying object between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. that evening. Several police officers also witnessed the lights. The event was witnessed by many people and it was also reported that there were some minor power outages in Toronto. Further photographs and a video from another location in North York were also reported. These are just some of the known sightings, but many others were also reported to KDORS, the Civil Aviation Daily Occurrence Report System, a digital archive that can be consulted thanks to Transport Canada, the federal department that oversees roads, railways, marine areas and Canadian transport planes. KDORS contains approximately 300,000 reports, ranging from mechanical breakdowns to rowdy passengers, and even collisions with flocks of birds. It also provides a fascinating record of UFO sightings reported by pilots in Canadian airspace. Thanks to these documents that archive all sightings concerning aerial transport, we can read about the morning of October the 21st, 2005, when air traffic controllers received a report from four different crews. This report involved a silvery, luminescent object that flew over Toronto at an altitude of approximately 9 kilometers, and then abruptly turned around and flew rapidly in a southeasterly direction towards Lake Ontario. Or, on the night of November the 12th, 2015, an aircraft 10 kilometers above Saskatchewan reported seeing a bright white light and warned that it was not a meteorite or other aircraft. The term UFO is used in very few cases. One case where the information changed is that of the Porter flight over Lake Ontario. An initial briefing notes that on November the 14th, a flight from Ottawa to Toronto reported passing near an unidentified object. And it is unlikely it was a weather balloon. But since two flight attendants were injured that day, the incident ended up in the pages of the newspapers and prompted investigators from the TSB, the Transportation Safety Board, to investigate further. Other cases have proved more difficult to explain, such as that of a Kalitta Charters Boeing 747 cargo flight, which detected a sporadic flying object, estimated at an altitude of between 14 and 18 kilometers and moving at Mach 4, or four times the speed of sound, as it traveled over the Northwest Territories on its way from New York to Alaska. On the 30th of April, 2018. There has never been any doubt that they saw something anomalous. But while most reports are uploaded to KDORS within days of sightings, 
This case took over a year and a half to upload. Another case occurred on January the 6th, 2019, when crew assigned to the Vanguard Air Care Medical Transport reported that an inexplicably strong light followed them at the same altitude and speed over the Manitoba region where no aircraft had been reported nearby. An unclassified intelligence report proves that the Canadian military was alerted when civilian pilots encountered flying objects they failed to identify. The examples may never end and we should already have confirmation that what is happening in our skies is real. As John Williams, a former Royal Canadian Air Force pilot, states, probably 90% of the things pilots see go unreported because they know that reporting them could have unfortunate repercussions on their career. Williams is an Air Force consultant, television commentator and airline pilot who spent 36 years in the Canadian military. He also worked as a flight safety officer for Transport Canada for more than 10 years. In fact, Williams states, that's why I believe the claims and sightings made and reported in those reports. Returning to the greatest documented event, the Falcon Lake incident, we can find many excerpts from Stephen Michalak's 40-page manuscript entitled My Encounter with the UFO, published in 1967. In one passage, Stephen narrates, It was 5.30 a.m. when I left the motel and started my geological trek. I brought with me a hammer, a map, a compass, paper and pencil and some food to get me through the day and I was wearing a light jacket against the morning chill. The day was bright, sunny, not a cloud in the sky. It seemed just like another day, but the events that would take place within the next six hours would change my whole life more than anyone could ever imagine. I will never forget May the 20th, 1967. While chipping away at the quartz, I was startled by the most eerie cackling of the geese that were still in the area. Something had obviously frightened them. Then I saw them. Two cigar-shaped objects with humps about halfway in the sky. They seemed to descend and shine with an intense scarlet glow. As these objects got closer to the earth, they became more oval in shape. Suddenly, the father of the two objects stopped dead in the air, while the other lowered closer and closer to the ground and landed squarely on the flat top of a rock about 160 feet away from me. The object that had remained in the air hovered about 15 feet above me for about three minutes, then shot up into the sky and was gone. Then my attention was drawn back to the craft that had landed on the rock. It too was changing color, going from red to gray red to light gray and then to the color of hot stainless steel with a golden glow around it. After regaining my composure and regaining my senses to some extent, I began to watch the craft intently, ready to record everything that happened in my mind. I approached the craft once more and touched its side. It was hot. It appeared to be made of a steel-like substance. There were no signs of welding or seams anywhere. The outer surface was highly polished and looked like coloured glass 
with light reflected on it. It formed a silver background as the sunlight hit its sides. I noticed that when I touched the side of the craft, it burned the glove I was wearing at the time. As I approached the site, I felt nauseous and my head began to ache. The spot where the ship had landed looked as if everything had been swept up with a broom. There was no debris of any kind on the rock. No twigs, pieces of stone, nothing. It had all been piled up into a circular mound six inches deep and around 15 feet in diameter. As I stood there examining the spot, the pain in my head became more severe. The waves of nausea increased and I broke into a cold sweat. I knew that something totally unnatural had happened to me and apparently it was having a negative effect on my body. Canadians have been reporting the same things over and over since the 1940s, says Hayes, an ex-pilot. Historically, it has always been incredibly difficult to get the Canadian government to talk about these issues. UFO investigator Chris Rutkowski has collected more than 22,000 reports over the course of three decades and has long since included KDOR's data in his annual Canadian UFO survey. He states, Regardless of what one may think about the existence of UFOs, it definitely remains a flight safety concern, as well as a public health perspective. Donald Spike Cavalinch is a recently retired Transport Canada surveillance pilot who also spent more than two decades flying for the Royal Canadian Air Force. And he states, I wouldn't describe any of these as insignificant, referring to the aerial incidents. These reports need to be taken seriously, and the fact that we have no real follow-up on any of these incidents speaks volumes about the inadequacy of our airspace safety. We are increasingly aware that there are greater forces above us who want to hide the truth from us. Thanks to the continuous efforts of all those human beings who want to know, one day we will be able to live knowing the greatest truths of our civilization, and perhaps also of those civilizations yet unknown to us. Those who have always come here to visit us and who apparently want to have contact with the Earth. So, what more is behind all of this? Who is behind all this? We must therefore reiterate. A citizen's right is to be able to know the truth about their life.